Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 349 featuring Kofi Opoku Ansa and Daniel Mark Miller who are representing the VFX Artist Podcast, something that Kofi started not long ago and is quite cool. Uh, and I really like talking to them. They're very interesting people, great, interesting artists, lots of interesting, their, their paths. But uh, but they decided to, uh, well, Kofi decided to start a podcast and uh, he needed some help on it. And so Daniel came in and helped to do the podcast too. And I actually went to be on their podcast. By the way, the whole podcast is called The VFX Artist Podcast. So definitely check Check it out and we'll have uh, links to it in the show notes. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so I'm actually on his podcast as well. So this is, a, shall we call it a podcast exchange program? Kristen, what did you think of Kofi and Daniel? Uh, they were great. Um, I like kind of both their stories. Um, Kofi's from his like late night with his child of how the podcast came to be. And then with mm -hmm. Daniel, um, I enjoy just hearing his like struggle in the beginning, his long commutes, um, Guinness, mm -hmm. beer and bread or beer and cheese you <laughs> talked about. Um, yep. But just to where they are now, um, and you also get a, um, like, it's just a lot of good advice from them. And like you said, how their podcast helps mentor other artists. Um, and Kofi also gets in, like, how interested he is in, like, every department of production. He's just so excited. Um, and that's kind of a goal is to like interview everyone one day. Um, so yeah, it's just like you get, uh, they have great ambitions and you kind of get to see and excited for how their careers will expand and yeah, yeah. They just they seem to love it a lot. So they do, they do, and I think it's really interesting. I mean, his his ambition with the VFX Artist Podcast is, you know, he's got to a certain point in his career where he's really enjoying and he really feels like it's going taking off and doing great things, and he wants to give that opportunity to anyone who wants to get into it and help them figure out, you know, here's how someone else succeeded. Why don't you look at that as an idea? And it was really kind of a great idea. And I think he's, it's really interesting. We'll see how, uh, I can't wait to see how this podcast uh, will, will, will continue to grow and definitely we'll be following them for sure. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and check them out. The VFX podcast, uh, it's available just like this podcast everywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, okay, we have, we don't have any events going on, but we do have some news. We do have the artist rendering challenge. Kristen, tell us a little bit about that. All right, so uh, this year the theme is Create a Better World, um, so you can share your vision uh, for a chance to win a V-Ray collection um, and Corona licenses um, and Chaos Cloud credits. So um, it's a lot of great prizes, and submissions end on November 23rd, um, and this is the, it's a little bit of a long URL, but it's chaos.com slash create a better world with a dash in between each, but you can just find it at chaos.com as well as searching um, student rendering challenge. That's true. And like, like Kristen said, there's a lot of great challenge uh, uh, prizes. There's going to be, you can get a V-Ray collection license, a Corona license, uh, some cl uh, 200 cloud credits. Uh, you can get a certified professional, professional access to the uh, Corona Academy. Uh, there's even a free pass to the Creative Lighting uh, Masterclass. So lots and lots of great stuff available. So go check it out. A really great jury selection too. I'm very, very, very cool. So lots of cool stuff. So definitely check it out. Uh, again, that is the Create a Better World or Student Rendering Challenge that we're offering. And the expiration is November 23rd. So coming up soon. So if you want to participate, Start, you know, <laughs> submit soon. All right, cool. And if people want to know more about this podcast, Kristen, where should they go? You can go to facebook.com slash CG Garage Podcast or chaos.com slash CG Garage. And if you'd like to watch us on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash chaos group TV. Perfect. And if you guys have comments, ideas, or anything else you'd like to say or let us know, or just say thanks for the podcast, that would also be nice, <laughs> you can email us at labs at chaosgroup.com, and we will go check out all those things. We've gotten some great suggestions on there, so please keep them coming. Uh, and if people, uh, if, of course, we always appreciate uh, a review on Apple Podcasts, so go ahead and leave us one there as well. But for now, enjoy episode number 349, Kofi and Daniel from the VFX Artist Podcast. Welcome to another CG Garage, where the chaos group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays 
in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passé. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. Thanks for joining me and for having this. And I actually want to thank Alex for his suggestion on on this uh, podcast. So that's cool. Um, but uh, okay, we were just we were just before you joined. I was just asking Kofi what inspired him to do this podcast so why don't you mm. tell that story <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um yeah it was mid-february of this year and it was, yeah it was around what 3 a.m in the morning my my three-year-old just woke up and then he just wanted to play with his toy cars um <laughs> it's too much energy so i couldn't go to sleep and then my mind just started rambling and um it just dawned on me that i had so much just because I'm a freelancer, I have so much connections on LinkedIn. And mm-hmm. um, it, I was thinking back about when, how I got into the industry. Um, and I was initially done on that. I had so much contacts that I could possibly just interview, bring people on, on the podcast and then just have them share their journey into the industry. Um, just so that in, in the case, my son or anyone else was looking to get into the industry they they might have some point of reference of how people got into the industry so yeah that that's that's how it started okay <laughs> that's how it started all right yeah. so so for your son yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what is your origin story how did you get into the industry <laughs> right okay yeah so um wow so i've been in the industry since 2011 um so i I studied the computer animation course at uh, Ravens Point University in London, um, and then so I, well. Okay, well, so, what did you get? What got you interested in it? Yeah, yeah. So I was quite interested in in video games, um, but I'm I'm not really a gamer. Um, just be, I was very very interested in video games just because I owned like a, a Nintendo Mega Sega Drive um, and mm-hmm. a Game Boy, which are the only two consoles that I've ever owned. Um, <laughs> and um, I I loved playing Final Fantasy VII <laughs> when I was growing up and I was just very inspired by it and, and so when I was at college I just literally just wanted to work in the video games industry um, so I did some research and did ended up doing some work experience and then I realized oh, I needed to to study a course that um, allowed me to to do 3D, um, either 3D modeling or animation. So after college, I I went to university to do a computer animation course, um, which um, then turned out, well, I realized in the first year that I didn't really enjoy animation um, and also because I wasn't too good at it. Um, so, but during that um, year, we were able to specialize in different, um, fields of the industry so I, I i found that i did enjoy 3d modeling um and uh, i stuck I stuck stuck by it um and then during my second year of university we had an industry day so we had like the likes of cinesite and mpc and the mill come in um and and they showed us their show rule really and what they do and i was literally blown blown away by <laughs> by what these companies do and it was literally also the first time that I'd learned about vi- visual effects. Um, prior to that, I just, I just knew or I thought I was going to leave un- university and, and go and work in the in animation studio. But I had mm-hmm. no notion or idea about vi- what visual effects was. So I was literally blown away by these studios. And then I ended up, literally after the event, uh, did a lot of research and I ended up sending about what 10 more than 10 letters by post like handwritten letters by post um asking okay. <laughs> yeah asking it, this was what what 20 2009 2009 okay. 2010 yeah so um yeah i'd sent some letters and um yeah of course i didn't hear back from many of them but i did hear back from the companies such as the mail and, and frame store and so during my second year, I was able to do work experience at the mill, 
and frame store and I fell in love with the mill. I literally just wanted to work at the mill as soon as I came out of university. Um, but then at the end of my my um, course on my third year, I came out of university and then I contacted my contacts at the mill and unfortunately they had no job openings. Um, so I, I couldn't get work at the mill. Um, but thankfully, just because I was, I did a lot of work experience at different studios prior to coming out of university. Um, I did work experience at a company called, used to be called Finish, which is now Free Folk. Um, so I did work experience with them and having not got a job at the mill, I, I emailed them and I just asked them to offer me a job at the lowest rate they could ever possibly offer me. <laughs> and um, yeah, they, they, I mean, they, they were very, um happy to have me on but not because they wanted a, a, an artist that was cheap but just because they were quite impressed about my persona and my how i was during my time during work experience with them so they they offered me a 3d assistant position with them and um yes yeah, so i was working with them for some time and then i've moved on uh, worked with glassworks for about three years um, okay. Yeah, and then yeah, moved on. So Glassworks was a medium-sized company. Um, they f- they focus on commercials, visual visual effects for commercials. I did that, and then um, yeah. 2000. What is it? What, so what would you? What did you get into? Did you get into? All right. So, lighting, modeling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah. So uh, at Free Folk, um, I was a three D assistant. So. It was a very small company, um, so I started off with uh, tracking um, and okay. yeah, a bit of generalist work. But my job was essentially learning to track um, with PF Track, um, mm-hmm. and then and then um, when I got to Glassworks, I said so yeah, Glassworks. I, I was I started off as a runner um, for a short while, and then. I was trialed into the three D uh, department for some time, and then they they took me on. So I was doing three uh, D tracking and then modeling. So a bit of everything as a generalist at Glassworks, um, and then for I was there for about three years or so, and then um, I started freelancing. Um, so I did uh, my first freelance uh, job was for for tracking position as well, um, just because. I, I seem to enjoy it. Uh, I I love I love um, match moving and tracking. Just there was uh, the aspect, some something about it that made me enjoy. It. Just the the feeling of being able to to solve something and have it work. It was just something about it that I enjoyed. And also mm-hmm. because I I love photography. I do a lot of photos. So um, I I had the knowledge. I had the knowledge of of, of cameras and like film bags and lenses so i guess that clicked um right yeah so i yeah i decided to focus on on match move just because i enjoyed it um and um yeah i've just been yeah freelancing since then and i've literally moved on from from commercials into film so i'm now freelancing um as a match move artist in the film industry okay yeah that's awesome that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I think it's really cool that you know you said you 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 know you did that and you because you've been freelancing all over the place. You've been doing uh, meeting a lot of people, mm. and uh, that was one of the things that inspired you to do the podcast, which we'll get into in, yeah. in a bit. But you started to get like doing the podcast. All of a sudden, you started to get too busy, and so you needed some help, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's that's how that's how Daniel comes in. So I had my 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 second child a month ago. But, right, and with that comes responsibility and less time. <laughs> right, um, I'm, right. Sure, I'm sure you guys know. Um, so, but Daniel has has always been very supportive about the podcast since I started it. He's very he's been very um, and yeah, and encouraging and very supportive. He's always like giving me advice. Um, so when 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 the baby came and I I had to put the the podcast on on hold for some time. And then Daniel was the only person I could think of uh, as someone that could potentially come in and and and, and be like a co runner or partner on the podcast. So I messaged him and, and asked him, and yeah, he was yeah he was happy to to be on board. So yeah, this is That's awesome. Yeah, 
So was, Daniel, tell so how did how did you find out about his podcast and how uh, all, you know what what sort of inspired you about what he was doing? Well, I I thought of doing something sort of similar for similar reasons. I mean, there wasn't the cars at three a.m. Although I've I've had <laughs> similar things with my kids, but um, it was it was just yeah similar thing. You meet people and they tell you these amazing stories. Guys who've worked on Illusion and they've worked on SGI machines and you know some of these people I try and get on as well, but. Um, I never just, I never actually did it, and Kofi went out and did it, right, made it happen. Um, and I found out about it because um, I'd met one of the first people he interviewed. So I'd just gone to this, like, networking event um, organized by Raindance, which is, like, a London film festival. It's obviously this joke name of uh, Sundance <laughs> because it's right. in London. And uh, so I met this guy called Ace Real. He's, he's amazing. He does, like... Um, mocap performance for monsters and and creatures of all kinds and and, he, and i met him really because he walked in with these ridiculous like these crazy arm extenders and, and of course you're like what are those and then it started this whole conversation and he and so i met i con um, got in touch with him on linkedin and then of course you get their news feed and so when he did the interview with kofi i saw that and i thought this is really cool um uh, and yeah so he's actually done it and so i started as a fan really followed it uh, for a while as a fan and then we got talking on on linkedin and and then you know he asked me some some of my thoughts and i said what i thought here and there and you know it seemed like it was an interesting conversation and then he was putting it on hold and then like a couple of days after he sort of contacted me and said hey you know do you want to come on board and i was like yeah, <laughs> totally because now it's all set up like the brand is there like we've already got the thing and I, i've right. just been contacting the people um so yep. you were actually the first person i interviewed Uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah so we it's been it's how did really that go fun. how did you feel about being uh being uh being an interviewer it was a little <laughs> uh well i hope i i hope i did all right i mean i i i mean it was it's, it's a bit you know it's a skill i mean it's one of those things i think you will you know grow into um i will you know kofi's got a head start but i think we're still both growing into it i've got you know a ways to go um It all seems to have kicked off with podcasts. I, I was on another podcast on Saturday. This was a complete coincidence. Um, wow. I back with it. And I've never done a podcast before. So, like, I did. I was interviewed on Saturday, and then I'm interviewing you on Tuesday, and here I am, you know, on Wednesday. Um, so, it's, it's, it's quite yep. a fun thing. Um, and, yeah, and this whole new world of, you know, um, uh, Riverside and, and all these, like, new softwares and things. I mean, a lot of things are things you know making videos I've, i i began before vfx i was um editing i, I started I, i thought i wanted to be an editor for quite a while I oh yeah let's talk about your origin story so you mm -hmm. wanted to be an <laughs> what got <laughs> you into what got you into the film industry because you obviously you have a lot of experience as well daniel right well i was bitten by this radioactive spider right um, no yeah. um so um so yeah well i i watched was a kid i watched all this sort of making of like there was the making of star wars and all those things where it was all practical and it obviously right. looked a lot cooler than when you're sitting in a computer but it, it, you see, and then it was kind of, there was no real like knowledge of how that was a real thing and it was always the kind of thing you told people and they're like yeah but what do you really want to do you know like what office do you want to work in right. so i did a general film studies degree and i did um it was um uh, communication audiovisual production it was quite a pretentious title but basically we did a bit of everything from journalism photojournalism to um to editing um we did a final short film project um and you know we were sh i mean to give you an idea we were shooting on svhs and uh, mini dv we hired because it was better than the svhs they had at university we were editing mm -hmm. with like you know the two tape decks and the little turntable thing um mm -hmm. so <laughs> you know they brought in an avid and i actually missed the avid because i did an exchange in italy which was great it was a right. fantastic experience but Because of so that, you were doing linear editing, is what you're saying, I was saying, literally right? linear editing, and if you wanted to dissolve, you had two tape decks. Um, I don't think people realize what linear editing is. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, it's, 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 you just think, well, I can just put the clip anywhere I want. No, <laughs> you've got to plan it out linearly, how the whole movie is, right? Yeah, like, like basically, if you if you change your mind about a cut late in a sequence, you would have to re-record the entire um, sequence. So that's, that, that's the basic thing about it. Like, <laughs> yeah. So that was the idea. So you, you can do your next cut and then you can do your next cut and then you can do your next cut. And so, right. yeah. So you would do the cut on paper and, and, and things like that. But I mean, those things are useful. It's a bit like, um, so a few years I did, um, I helped out on 
people's films for no money basically like as a lighting assistant i mean a lighting assistant on set like spark right um and a short film and that meant i had other jobs which were ranging from like cutting cauliflowers to working in a factory to working in offices the fact that i'd learned italian on the exchange was actually really useful because i could get these slightly higher paid office jobs than i otherwise could get and while i was trying to you know do something but okay. in the end, I ended up in one of these office jobs uh, and they were like offered me a permanent contract, which I actually took because um, it was just after 9-11. So there was like, was, are there going to be any jobs at all? So I might as well take, I'll take this even if it's not what I want to do. But um, after a year of that, I like, I was like, I'm leaving. And I went on what we call a bus month holiday. So I went to Italy um, and just, um, I taught English, did translations and w- just made my own short films. And people liked them they were funny and you know they, they enjoyed them I had some good actors which was just by chance my flatmates were actually a troop of actors basically um, but uh, the downside was they were always technically flawed especially the audio but even uh, the actual like image quality like when we sent them into broadcasters they were like it's not broadcast standard and I was like well right. what is broadcast standard what are you talking about <laughs> like, what, does, oh, yeah. what does this mean so I got on this uh, this started me on this whole journey of what does this mean how do you you know how do you find out all this stuff um, you know it was all it was all you know at the beginning it was all kind of Greek um, mm-hmm. uh, and one of my short films I start was a sci-fi and I started learning you know I started putting in some VFX with uh, After Effects which we're pretty terrible. It was basic screen replacements. This guy has this bit of blue paper, which he turns into this kind of iPad type thing, which I've got to say was before the iPad existed. So it was, you know, I could have <laughs> charged Apple some money. But uh, right. it, it was pretty terrible. I mean, it was pretty ropey when I look back on it. This was like 2005. But okay. I kind of kept trying to learn a bit more. And then they were like, you know, After Effects is not what people are using. They're using this software called Shake. So I thought, I'll find out how to learn this thing called Shake. And there was like, uh-huh. there was Gnome on DVDs. DVDs yeah. <laughs> and um, which yeah and so you start with I've that I've done a couple of, of those <laughs> yeah so I did so I did that and um, I then this thing called FX PhD came out and that was the first like where you oh, actually right. had some insight into what people were doing like actual right. artists that was because, Mike Seymour's thing right uh, yeah and it was guy, yeah and I, th- I mean, there's a lot now, but at the time, that was the, the first time you had, like, this, apart from the actual knowledge of software, but this actual insight into what was going on in people's heads when they were doing, you know, comp or 3D or whatever. So I got to the point where I knew Shake um, a bit. I did a friend's music video for no money and I did loads of stuff in Shake, which, again, was really ropey. But mm-hmm. the good thing was, because I shot it myself, I shot the green screen really badly, which was actually really good because if you ever go on a you know in a, into a production job the green screen is never shot really well or right. really like how it shot for tutorials which are made right. by vfx artists who shoot green screens the way they want them to be shot and not how right. they are shot so um and i got a job i managed to get a job somehow on a film called baria which was um an italian movie by the same director as uh, cinema paradiso giuseppe tornadore and uh, that was kind of cool, um, but I had no idea what I was doing. I was I'd literally just done tutorials. <laughs> there I am, and I wasn't in Roto. I was like actually supposed to like comp these green screenshots, and it was a bit of a like it was a bit of a nightmare um, from that point of view. I did get a few shots in there, um, and there were a couple that I was like, you know, they were like, you know, actually you're taking too long on this, and fair enough. They, it was just like massive long blue screen things, and it's in shake, um, which had no one do. So, you know, again, this linear, <laughs> do the thing. Uh, right. Uh, then, I came, then I was like, okay, but this was in Milan. So I was living in Rome. And I, by this time, I was with my now wife. And we had our first kid. Um, okay. And the thing was, like, Milan is a long way from Rome. And it's like a four-hour commute. And this train is always packed. Um, and I was like, if I'm going to Milan, which is already... a a faff and I was renting a room for the week for during the week and going home at the weekends and so really not making any money anyway by that time I'd done all that um I was like why don't we go to London I'm from London like <laughs> let's go where all the work is of course my wife was quite happy in Rome um but eventually she sort of I was she was convinced and we all went and I started working doing like graphics for Sky um uh, but they by that time they weren't using Shake, so I'd learn I learnt Nuke. Um, I did do a couple of jobs in, in Shake at some point, um, and I did yeah freelanced around, and then I got a job 
at uh, McCann Erickson, they had a in-house VFX department, so they're an ad agency. Um, and I was there for a couple of few years, and that was that was quite interesting because I learned Maya from like a really good Maya artist, and I was doing rendering because it was a little tiny little department. It was literally me and the three D guy. Uh, we were doing a bit of everything, you know, like we would. I was doing some new, but I was also doing some After Effects, like billboard stuff. Um, right. We were doing, we were rendering um, in V Ray. Uh, no, we were mental ray. Sorry, right. Uh, we did, I we did get them to get V Ray, um, okay. Which a freelancer showed us. He'd just done this like um, car commercial uh, for Toyota or something, and and yeah, and it looked really good, and it was like a lot easier. And and for me, mental ray was always a bit of a you know, it's a bit, it was a bit mental. <laughs> like it really was mental. <laughs> I was like, I, Why you didn't like it. using the final gather tool? <laughs> yeah, all all of this stuff. You're like, what, what's going on? And then Vimo was just so easy. It was like really easy. Um, by comparison, I mean, right. it's still you, there's still like lots of buttons and lots of things to get wrong. Yep. Um, but um, you know, so the nice thing about being something small is you do you you you've got lot, you're wearing lots of hats. So I was quite generally but still the compa. And if there was like, if, you know, really I did most of the 3D when, like, when Janish wasn't around. And then I would like, they're like, Dan, can you render this out? I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> And I, I, you know, I really enjoyed it. But I did um, move, and I and I did I did a whole series of, like, I did a, like, these animated little stings for, um, for, for Sheba and Love Film, which was like, like the early Netflix when they used to send DVDs, but the British version. I think. And um, so we did this advert for that. They went on the cinema, which was quite cool. And I animate. I did everything from like animated these models and and d- did all this stuff. D- came up with. Like, I, they just got the creatives. Just gave us these puns. Uh, so the good thing was the creatives were upstairs, so they would come in and you would get this idea of what it's like to work with you know ad people. Um, and then I. Uh, was made redundant and yeah, they decided they weren't going to do the effects anymore in the house and I went to a place called and I freelanced a bit and did a low budget film um, which actually paid better than most of the big budget it was, it was just one of those funny things it was just that mm-hmm. I was the only new <laughs> I was the only, arti- the only artist on the film and uh, that, no there was a 3D again there was one 3D guy and one composer but then um, I got a job at Molinaire and I was there for like four years as lead compositor there. When I say lead, when I started, I was the only compositor and then they grew to about 12. And by the time they grew, they actually hired in a, a supervisor, Dolores. Um, and so it all, you know, it, it slowly grew, but it never grew massive and it was all pretty much 2D work. If any 3D came in, I would do it. Um, and I did actually, you know, so I did sort of keep my hand a little bit in the 3D there. And then after that, I went to one of us and that was, you know, the biggest shoot I've been at, actually, weirdly, um, in all this time I'd been working. I'd always been at these little places or small departments. You know, Molina's not actually that small, but it's, it's a tiny, de- Vivex tiny department. And, uh, yeah, so I worked on this uh, Italian movie, Pinocchio, which was kind of kind of cool because it was like kind of coming full circle to my first job mm-hmm. like back on the Italian movie and the guy I was like sitting next to was one of the guys I've been sit- doing roto prep with like as a freelancer like so it was it felt like this like sort of coming home and I was there for a couple of years uh until like literally this summer uh and the last film I worked on was Matrix Resurrections um uh, which was from home obviously there was COVID and all this stuff and uh, then right. I went to um I went to Fame Store and I've been there a month. So uh, just okay. a month. So we'll see what happens there. <laughs> but you were in Italy for a long time. I was there for like seven years. Um, okay. And I, and I was apart from, so I was apart from teaching English and doing my own short films, I worked for this guy that I'd hired a camera from. So I, I was editing, I edited a documentary. I did like ENG type camera work. Uh, yeah. film, filming uh, theatrical events and operas. And I did behind the scenes for DVDs. So, yeah, I can imagine that there's not much visual effects in Italy. I mean, there are a lot of Italian VFX artists, and they're mostly everywhere but Italy. I, right. I think it's, <laughs> yeah, you meet them everywhere. Every facility you go to, you'll meet a lot of Italians, right? Because they have these, they do have some really good VFX schools, and, and they now produce a lot of really talented artists. But they clearly don't keep them all employed because they're all right. Everywhere else. Yeah. Having said that, there, I mean, I think there are a few places doing some good stuff. I mean, a lot of 
you know they do a lot of historical things i think that the, the church actually like makes a lot of like documentaries about like francis of assisi and and stuff like that so they, there's a lot of room for like making these big environments of of you know renaissance italy um <laughs> like uh, that's it. every every facility i look at their reel and they do a lot of that and then they, you know there's advertising so they've got a few places but yeah it's not an enormous industry um you know well that's cool okay so then so so you you obviously have a lot of connections in the same way so you guys share a lot of that 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 in in the, in the same way that you guys have been working all over the place and meeting all kinds of people and that's sort of how did you guys know each other before or or did you just were you just a fan of the podcast daniel yeah i was just literally just a fan i just literally knew um i think i knew one of the people he interviewed maybe a, uh, maybe maybe a couple of them but uh yeah so i'd not i had i didn't know yeah. we just got to know each other through linkedin and just messaging and and talking so through chats so all completely virtual and it was yeah you know um i think it was still in lock, lockdown actually so <laughs> yeah. we didn't there was we, even though we were both in london we couldn't mm. like just go and meet up anywhere anyway have you been able to meet up since uh, not we, yet. We ha- not yet. Really? Not yet. I'm still working from home. Yeah, I'm still uh, working right. from home. Yeah. But, so, yeah. I, and I, you know, we've both got kids, and so once mm. you finish work, you tend to you you are sort of stuck at home anyway. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Um, but at yeah. some point we will. Yeah, it's gonna um, happen. And we'll yeah, we definitely need to. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the irony is that we we, we found out that because I I lived in Milan as well, so oh it, okay, yeah, it's just yeah, it's just funny how, how things go, but yeah. Yeah, I just saw on his LinkedIn he spoke Italian as well. I was like, ah, okay, how did that happen? <laughs> there you go. There you go. So there might well, cool. be an Italian edition of. Uh, yeah. Of- <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. Would you do it in Italian or you keep it in English? I mean, English keeps it kind of more universal. In some I ways. mean, you've got more people. Yeah, you've got mm. more potential audience. I mean, <laughs> yeah. if it's a, you know, who knows, a, a special someone. If someone doesn't actually doesn't speak English, then you know, mm-hmm. yeah, sure. There was a, I did one episode where uh, it was in Japanese, but it was, I don't speak Japanese, so I was a translator. <laughs> so, so we had a translator involved, uh, which was cool because a translator translated into English for me and into Japanese for that person. So a Japanese person or someone who didn't speak, who only spoke Japanese mm-hmm. or, or didn't speak English uh, could actually listen to it. So but it, it made the podcast long. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you have to say everything twice. <laughs> yeah. At least twice as long, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and hopefully nothing gets lost in the mm. translation. But, uh, but yeah, that was a, that was a lot of, uh, that was a lot of fun. Well, that's so cool. And I tell you, you know, doing a podcast, it's, it, you know, I was telling Daniel yesterday, it's been almost seven years that I started doing this podcast. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I, I can only imagine uh, starting over, and I'm doing two of them now, which is yeah, even crazier. Yeah. So, uh, so that's a that's that's a lot. And I think what, one of the things I want to make sure you know, like I love promoting other people's podcasts because uh, podcasts aren't competitive, <laughs> <laughs> or shouldn't be, yeah. because if you like one podcast, you're gonna like another one that's similar. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you're gonna promote uh, yeah. cross promotion. I think is kind of an important thing so all right so we're uh, just just i'm not you know i'm going uh, I definitely want to talk to you guys more about stuff but if people want to find your podcast where where can they find them yeah well um at the moment you can literally just google the, the vfx artist podcast um we're currently building our website but um yeah we're on we're on most platforms like spotify apple podcast and amazon uh google podcast uh youtube as well but um yeah literally if you search the VFX Artist Podcast, yeah, you'll find us. But our website is coming soon. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, 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 what is your, what is the? I mean, what is your mission? Obviously, you said you want to interview people yeah. and let people know about, you know, how how other people got into the industry, etc. Mm. But what's what's what is your your mission with this podcast? Yeah. So um, when I started, the, the the reason the mission was to to bring artists on to um, interview them. And the, the the mission was to inspire the next generation. So I was maybe I was looking at my son, who's like three years old now. Maybe he gets to eighteen, he might want to work in VFX, and he might have some resources on on someone um, telling their story on how they got into the lighting department at I don't know ILM, and he right. can take some notes and 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 get some idea and 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 then have 
have a head start or at least have an idea of what he needs to do but um essentially it's we're just literally doing it for all artists um just because we're, we're artists as well so we we just want to bring the day-to-day current or like um stories and 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 tools or yeah routines because, yeah yeah because i think people want to move get into the industry but they also want to move up through the industry right mm-hmm. so if you're if you're already in the industry as a compositor maybe you want to become a lead or you want to become a, a supervisor so you want to hear right. that journey you might not be so bothered about how they started in Vodafone. but okay fine but you want to know what they did next so you might, <laughs> you might you wouldn't fast forward but you 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 know the conversation should be interesting to everyone and i that's why when when i interviewed you i was you know relatively techy like in, I, I i didn't sort of shy away from talking about you know noise thresholds and global illumination and and all of these things and and the fact that you know the, the ambient occlusion used to be the way people did. i mean these sort of things are, are interesting right. because you know, you're in, I think when I was listening to the FX Guide podcast, when I wasn't in the industry, there was a lot of stuff they were saying. I had no idea what they were talking about, but I wanted to know. So it, it was right. still kind of like, you know, <laughs> like a movie where you want to hear the big reveal later. You know, you're like, mm-hmm. ah, you know. And I think people come on to um, forums or they go onto any sort of Facebook page or any kind of thing where they're talking about VFX. And there's always something that goes, how do I get into it? And they, they just have some, they get very vague feedback and I think the nice thing about in individual artists is it's quite specific you know like everyone has mm-hmm. got their path whether it's lighting or whatever but I mean you know as we say well just listen to the two of your paths so, so different right yeah yeah you, and we're you, probably didn't, ha- you didn't handwrite a bunch of letters to some studios did you <laughs> <laughs> I, I did actually but I never got any work that way I did I, I did <laughs> before I went to Italy I did actually try the whole runner thing um but and I and I, when I was a runner, like it, you actually were running around with tapes and things, um, mm. and I just couldn't afford it. I mean, if if I'm honest, like I, I was working for a small like corporate video company. They had right. uh, they were spending huge amounts of money on these events because it was the sort of early two thousands when they really just like if we did these events. I'd organise these events where they just buy they'd spend huge amounts of money. But you know, I was on this. I, I could barely survive on the money I was getting paid, mm. and I was just living off the cheese and toast in the fridge and Guinness, which was always available for free. So. <laughs> (laughs) that was my diet out there and you know and then i then i then after my three month contract i freelanced there and it was only like 50 pound a day and they had these their payment terms were like 68 days from um from when you do when you from invoice wow and and you were lucky to get that so like you know you're you're, you've worked you know four days you get 200 pounds which is still not a lot of money to live on in london and then right. they're like oh wait no um you know and then of course when you get to 68 days they're like oh but it hasn't gone in the system you know you know all if you've ever invoiced anyone you know exactly all the things oh we've just changed the account start you know blah 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 just, right so then i ended up just temping in offices and that's how i ended up not in the industry at all uh, for a bit and that's how i got so old before i got in really. <laughs> yeah yeah you know, it's funny. I was remember, you know, tell, you guys telling me the story about, you know, how how you guys, you know, cold called people or did this thing. I remember I actually cold called Blur Studio, mm-hmm. and I got. It's funny because I know the Blur guys really well now, but uh, I got the the receptionist at the time who is still there, and her name is Betty, and she's amazing, <laughs> but I didn't know her, and she, I said, I, yeah, I basically like. What do I have to do to get a job at the blur? <laughs> so, <laughs> and she's like, Do you know Max? Is like, yeah. And he goes, Your demo reel. The only thing that matters is your demo reel. You gotta get that. And she basically told me like that on the phone is like, otherwise Tim's never gonna look at this. And I'm like, Okay. <laughs> and so I look I just worked really, really hard on my demo reel, right? And I did that. And what's funny is I remember that piece of advice and it was very good. But I remember like, you know, 20 years later, whatever, I'm, I'm hanging around Blur. It's like, you know, Betty, do you know that you gave me one of the best career advices like 20 years ago? She goes, what are you talking about? It's like, I called you. <laughs> and and she, she's like, wow, you know. So it, that's another thing that I think is important. And I think, you know, you guys both actually have said it. Uh, you know, the connections are very important. This is a small industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And how many jobs now do you get because you know someone? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and they encourage it as well. Like I mean, like if uh, an FM store, they even like they offer you a fee if you find someone that they they keep, 
at the moment. Oh, right. So, so like, you know, they, 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 it's not just a, like a thing. And I think people also forget that their peers, their, their peers are their best contacts. I think people who are outside the industry, they think that the contact is like you meet the CEO of ILM and they like give you a job. CEO doesn't, isn't an artist sitting in the seat. They don't ask the CEO who's, who can do roto prep, right? They ask the roto prep team, do you know anyone else that can do any other good roto artists? So right. it's, it's the people at your level that are your best contacts, absolutely, more than supervisors or you know company directors or producers. It's those people that do the same job that you want to do or that you do, because you know that if you if someone if you if your college friend has just gone got a job as a roto artist, and you were good on their like group project and, and they got on well, then they'll they'll try and get you on board because they they have an interest in that. If you were if you were lazy or annoying then they won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you think about, what do you, what do you guys think about, uh, you know, uh, your roles? You know, the podcast is a great idea, by the way. Uh, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm a huge podcast <laughs> person. So I, should, of course I'm going to support it, but about mentorship, right? Like there's an, there's an ability of to mentor people in, in that role that you can do. What do you think about, uh, the role that artists have, uh, as mentors for people? Yeah. I'm, I'm a v big advocate for, for mentoring and mentorship. Um, just because growing up, um, when I was, I think when I was at college, um, I, or, or secondary school, I was assigned. So my secondary school were assigning mentors from, from, from the industry. And I was assigned a mentor who was working in the financial, um, um, industry. And she, she turned out to have contacts, um, in the graphic design and video games industry and she 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 managed to 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 guide me and help me research and 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 organize work experiences and and um give advice and and it's just it turned out to be a, a great relationship like we still we still in contact um to this day and um so yeah i'm very i'm a big advocate for it cuz it's it, it's it's great to be to be able to 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 go to to go through and learn something and share your experience and and um if 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 someone is willing to 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 listen it's it's just i i think is is like impeccable um um advice for for people to to pick on so i think yeah it's um i i've I'm actually doing something a bit formally for this thing called access v f x they have a platform where you can um you can it pairs you with with mentees mm -hmm. um as an artist so you say what you do and they they pay you up with um three people so i've got these three people that i've been you know sort of following and you know that when they're starting to get their first jobs and it's, it's you know that's very rewarding um and also at, at work at you know at molinaire we had runners and you'd ask if they were interested in vfx and some of them would come in some of them would sit down and do it and get really bored and you'd see that and actually don't want to do VFX and some of them you know have gone on to become um, leads and and do all these really cool things one's an engineer um, we had an actual apprentice program and one of the apprentices like uh, is now an engineer at the foundry so they've, they've all it's it's really cool like what what people can do and to see you know people's growth is is really exciting I think um, and it's something that you you wish you'd had right you, so you want to make sure that you know you are able to do that because every every time someone does that for you it's a it's a just big step up and just to be able to get other people moving because it's not again like the podcasting it's not competitive right there there are a lot of vfx artists. just look at the credits there's like loads of them um maybe once you start going for supervisor jobs it gets a little bit more competitive because the bottleneck gets narrower but definitely for like getting into comp and getting into you know all of those things it's really important and people you know people remember it when you help them uh, you know from a purely selfish point of view people do always remember when you help them out so yeah i think that's absolutely true and i also think you know like that's that's another thing right like like you guys are podcasting now so you're helping a much broader group of people right with a lot more information so that's also something that's important you know i've enjoyed i've enjoyed that 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 part of podcasting honestly is bringing stories to people and, and doing that so i think i can totally understand yeah. uh that, that excitement that it has um and so yeah i think mentoring is mentoring is cool i mean what do you have i mean obviously you've been doing this you've only started this year right yeah 
to doing this. Mm. So do you have ambitions of what, where you want to go or is it already like, oh, I just want to just see how this goes for now? <laughs> no. I mean, yeah, I do have ambitions. So literally on the same day that I had the idea, I literally wrote it down in my notes on my phone. And yeah, okay. my, yeah, um, I'd love to in the future be able to, to, I don't know, turn up at Pinewood Studios and be able to an interview a director or, or just literally someone and and be I'd love I'd love to like just travel to Hollywood and and be on set just literally interviewing people and literally yeah learning more about what they do and 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 all sorts. Um, so yeah, that's 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 my my goal. My that's my dream anyway. So, <laughs> but yeah. are you doing this because you want to know or because you want everyone else to know? It sounds like you are <laughs> you are generally curious about everything. I mean yeah, I mean yeah, of course. I mean I, I love learning and ever since ever since um starting the podcast i've i've wanted to to interview someone in the in the um a makeup department say uh, prosthetics um but they're so difficult to find and and get hold of so i'm still on a search to find someone just because i think it's 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 a department that's very interesting or i find interesting anyway and I'd you love should look up shane mahan <laughs> shane mahan yeah he's uh he did some amazing Right. head stuff and yeah 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 it's really cool yeah so yeah th that's the aim really i just want to bring on all sorts of different people from different departments and different scenarios and just, just literally yeah um get people learning and inspire people i similar thing i think it's you've got it's an it's a combination of it's a, it's a really great excuse to get in touch with um new people in sex you know sectors that you don't know much about sure. um, it's also a great way to like get back in touch with people um, that you've you know lost touch with and kind of get them sort of involved, and you you do learn a lot. It's like when you teach, you learn a lot when you teach because you have to you have to make sure that you actually really understand mm -hmm. the thing that you've just been kind of doing instinctively or not really thinking about. Um, in a big have way. you been teaching a lot, Daniel? Well, when when I was in when I was in Italy, I taught English as a foreign language. And oh, that's right. Although that's that right. was a bit of a side step, it's actually come in useful when I've been you know when I had trainees. I kind of had that approach of how to break down what I was doing. So I sort of feel like if I ever, if I know something, I can, I can break it down in a way that people can understand it. Um, I did a course for Pluralsight on V-Ray actually, um, uh -huh. which is still there, although it's on like V-Ray version three. So it's, it's a bit out of date. It's a five star rated course. So <laughs> as, a, as, as a beginner, so yeah. Yep. So, um, so that, that's been, you know, a cool thing. And I do want to, you know, um, do more of that sort of stuff which connects with another project that I'm doing which I might want to jump in with before we run out okay <laughs> which what is you, what, which, what, what, what project are you working on <laughs> so I've got so I've got this short film Broken Toy uh -huh. which I wrote yeah. um, the screenplay for and I really concentrate on the screenplay I did actually like one of my other ambitions was screenwriting so it's, it was it was I, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't like a showreel piece like it will have vfx in it it's sci-fi um mm -hmm. speculative fiction um vibe so in that sort of black mirror twilight zone era and it's got a fully cg character in it who is the toy of the, the titular toy mm -hmm. and so i concentrated on the actual writing of it and sent it to screenplay competitions got feedback you know worked on the feedback uh, made sure i had some industry feedback by asking people that weren't my friends and weren't my family um and just getting getting it to where it needs to be um so broken toy is is basically an odyssey of this toy which has been thrown away there's something wrong that it has to put right in the home and it's on a journey journey back and in confronting you know and it's it's made for it's a toy made for toddlers so I, I like really weak characters i mean if you think of lord of the rings what's so great about it is not it's not the wizards and the warriors it's it's you know it's sam and frodo who are like the, the weakest characters in the sh in the movie who have to do everything and that that's kind of you know i like those characters that have to deal with something that's much bigger than they are but not necessarily so rather than going the Hollywood approach of making the problem really enormous, like the whole world's going to be destroyed if they don't do this, just make it like a an, a problem, but make the character really small so that they're at that scale where for them it is their whole world, right, that they have to save. Right. Um, and so that's that's the journey I've been making there. And then in terms of actual the production of it, 
what we're doing and we've been i've been talking as well as with chaos group actually with mm -hmm. alex um which put us in touch uh but also with um God, with Cave Academy, who do mm -hmm. um, courses for VFX, really brilliant stuff. And the idea being to, the idea being to do an open production. So as we film it, as we storyboard, as we do the, as we finish the assets, we actually just release them to the opposite of the NDA. Every, everything's a closed box, right? You sign all this stuff. You can't tell anyone the movie you're working on. And then when, by the time you can tell anyone, it's like the technology is out of date. No one knows what's going on. Um, so this is just, you know, we'll we'll share the HDRIs, we'll share the photogrammetry, you know, after a certain point, we'll share the asset, you you know, we'll, we'll share some of the footage so that, you know, if, if, if you know, Kofi wanted to produce a, a tracking tutorial, he could use something from a movie. Uh, oh, interesting. Which is, because if you've ever done match moving tutorials, which I have, they're like, they're always like this perfect dolly past like a, a letterbox. <laughs> right. And it's like the ever, perfect green screen problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you ever watch a movie, that's not what you get. You get over the shoulder shots, mm -hmm. focus pulls, all this crazy stuff that is just like, you know, it's just hard right. to deal with. So that's the kind of spin off. And, and the idea is that, or maybe the short film will exist as it, in one world, and then, you know, the, the, the spin off material will, you know, be its own thing as well uh, and help people bring, you know, come into the industry. Similar, similar sort of um, goal as the podcast in that sense. And the film mm -hmm. itself is, uh, I mean, Broken Toys is a metaphor for like a child who's, you know, been harmed. So it is, it is a little bit about, you know, some of the, some topics that are, um, you know, quite, quite important, really, like a, a bit more beyond that. So, yeah, just, to, I just like that kind of small scale sci-fi that's, you know, um, like if you, if you, you know, watch, if you think of Black Mirror, if you think of the old Twilight Zone episodes where there's just this little twist and there's a, a bit of a, um, there's just one thing that is different from the everyday world. Right. Well, that's really cool. I mean, Kofi, do you have any um, um, filmmaking ambitions yourself? <laughs> um, not currently, not currently. Um, um, no. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, you are, I, you I, are I, working on films, but I am working but, on but, films. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But I mean, aside from much moving, I've, lighting is something that like, I've always wanted to to get into just because I love photography and I love being able to understand how lighting works and so it lighting department is something that I've I've been very curious about. So in the future if I choose to um yeah, move on from match move um, I'd like to explore lighting. Yeah. Yeah. What uh what what do you what do you guys uh think in terms of, you know, where where you think the industry is going? Like from now, you know, like obviously there's a lot of things happening. A lot of things are happening now in real time compared to the, what they used to be in the past. So what what are your thoughts about about how our roles are going to change in the visual effects world and what our, what our responsibility is as podcasters to communicate that? <laughs> I think a lot of the boring stuff is going to gonna sort of fall by the way. I mean, like, you know, look at the machine. Like, like you look at some of the face tracking you've got when you do Google. Uh, you know, right. when you do, on Google Meets, it's not quite right, but it's like as good as a first pass you get out of 3D. And if you think of how much of a pain in the bum like it is to get to that point with any right. kind of tracking software, it's actually you know really impressive and it's you know real time. Right. My corner. So I have <laughs> kids. <laughs> yeah, I'm going. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know that drawing but house? My, There's like a poster. Yeah. <laughs> He's hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you need to put up the drawing. Okay, I will do. I, I will do. Bye. So, what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> that was I'm awesome. Saying, yeah. That was, and she, she's actually in. So, um, she, that's the segue to something else. But she was. Uh, Mariam is my daughter. And she was in a promo we did for Broken Toys. So, we did an advert for the toy when the toy is brand new. So in a very okay. different style to the dark movie, we did the like happy, you know, in a park, um, God rays and sunsets kind of like a toy advert for this toy. And right. um, so there's there's work we're going to do in terms of the, the, the toy itself and the look, Dev, and all those things. But I, I don't even know, like just from, a, you know that apart from that, it's easier to make something dirty and grimy look real than, than a product. If you When you work on ads, like you've done car ads, uh, if you do a car for an ad and you do a car for a film, like... 
apart from the time, the technology, if you had the same time and the same software and the same artists at the same level, you know that the car in the advert has to be perfect and clean and, and sort of pristine. And so it, it has an unreality anyway. Um, right. And in the movie, it's going to have like bits of mud spat around the, the hubcaps and all of that stuff. So in a similar vibe, you know, the advert, is, is a producty kind of it, we really wanted to make it look like an advert and not like a trailer so how good an idea that was <laughs> in terms of like viral strategy i don't know but it was it was fun anyway and yeah and, and she had fun as you can see yeah so so yeah. she can interrupt i guess my that's fine that. but, happens all the time <laughs> And I was the best saying, ones I mean, are the cats, I don't know what the I was cats that come, in, the cats that come <laughs> inside of the ca- cameras. Those are the ones that I love. It's like, <laughs> especially when they turn around and you see their rear end. Whoa! <laughs> yeah. Should there be audio description for people that aren't watching that are just like listening to the podcast? <laughs> uh, no, that's fine. Well, they, they'll they'll hear that they'll hear her coming in, which is great. Which is great. I love that. I did one. I did one with um, uh, uh, my friend Carlos, and his son came in, and he's like. Started talking. I was like, all right, you're part of the podcast now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So yeah, she uh, really wants she likes doing the weather. She she as soon as you got the microphone out, she's like, I wanna do my weather reports. Um, oh so. good. Yeah. You know who does really great weather reports in Los Angeles? David Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> Go to his YouTube and he will read the weather every day and put it up on YouTube. Wow. <laughs> it's that. kind of amazing. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Go look at David Lynch's. I, I just report. think of Bill Hicks when I think of like um, Los Angeles <laughs> weather. When he just says, you know, he says, "I love coming to London for the weather." You guys have London. You yeah. have weather. <laughs> have weather. Yeah. yeah. In in Los Angeles, hot and sunny every day. Hot and sunny. I had some guy. Uh, I had an English guy who was here who was visiting. He says, "You know, it's funny in in the U, in London we that what, what we talk about every day is the weather. Like, how was the weather today? Right? Mm-hmm. And in LA, what we talk about every day is how was the traffic today? Because <laughs> the weather's the same, but, but the traffic is can be horrendous. Right. Um, okay, so so listen, uh, what are you know? Yeah, you said you know obviously tr- uh, some of the things that are happening. Machine learning is going to make things a lot a lot better in a lot of ways. I mean, I've seen some things where you know even even at Famous, one of my colleagues, where he's done you know found that there's some simple shots you do and you can just like even within nuke you can use the the copycat in nuke and just like replicate that effect so you mm-hmm. know things like you know a lot of the sort of when you add scars or change people's eyes or you know those kind of beauty work you just you might just do that on one or two shots or even just like a few still angles and then just let the thing uh, take care of it and then if it, if it doesn't look good enough you just do another you just do another one the old fashioned way and then that adds to the data set so the next shot is better and you know so it, effectively it means you're going to need you're going to produce more shots per artist so i think there is going to be an element of yes you are, there is going to be at some point a bit of a cull of some of those tasks that are, i mean i guess for the outsourcing is where it's going to, it's going to be cheaper to get it to do it with your senior artists doing it with machine learning than is with all the complications of outsourcing so I, right. I don't, you know, I think that's going to be interesting. Work from home, I think, is here to stay. I, I see companies sort of like, come on, let's come back to the office. It's going to be wonderful. And and you see the chat and the artists and <laughs> it's very different. Like, it's a very different picture. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how do, you, how do you guys, how Kofi, how do you feel about working from home? Oh, yeah, I love it. I mean, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying that just because I'm currently, I'm, I'm, I'm working with Trickster and so, in this case, I would have to be in Munich, in, in Germany. Um, right. And the first time I worked with Trickster, I had my first son. Um, and at the time, he was starting to crawl and I was away. And um, I had to, like, I couldn't stay for long. So they literally, they, 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 they wanted to extend me. And I was like, no, I, I miss my family. So I can't, I can't really stay. So just yeah, being able right. to work from home is just, yeah, it's great. Because family is just outside behind the door. And I can see them all the time. So. Yeah, yeah, and and I think also no matter how much you love your job, I don't think there's anyone that loves their commute. I mean, you talk about traffic, but we you know we get the train and and, and it's always late and it it's and you can cycle and I like cycling, but not in the middle of winter. It's less fun and once <laughs> it, it's fun in the green areas and the cycle paths, but then you get into town and you as a cyclist you're allowed in London to ride on the bus lanes, but there are buses and they are diesel buses and then the black cabs and they're diesel cabs. So, you know, you're, you're in this thing and they're, and they're manic, you know, it's, it's like, it's once you get into town, being on a bike is no longer fun 
you know. Um, yeah. So I, I like. Yeah, I'm saving two hours of traffic every day by. Uh, so. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, just I mean, it's it's at least two hours of your day every day. I mean, even mm-hmm. the fact you know we we scheduled this for me for six thirty, so I finish at six, mm-hmm. um, and you know did this at six thirty, and that that that's amazing. I mean, I would you know also the industry I think is getting better with hours. It's another yeah. thing I would never, even if it was right next to the office. I think like twenty fifteen, I would never have like scheduled something for six thirty. If I was due to finish at six, I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> Six thirty, yeah. you start cutting it fine because they'll always. And you probably like, wouldn't have the energy after you know finishing work and getting home through all the traffic. You're like, oh, I'm not yeah, doing a podcast it, it, now. It, it, <laughs> even if you said like, let's meet, let's do this in person in a in a cafe near near where I worked, and I didn't right. have the commute. I would still be wary of the fact that I wouldn't leave the office at six. So I, I, right. I you know, there's always that VFX. And I'll do one more render. I'll just do another <laughs> render. I'll just check that. You know, and you know, and yeah. It, so there's always that feeling that you you would always leave. You know, if you due to leave at six, you leave at seven. And sometimes you do. Like we have delivery days and things, and there's a crunch at the end and all that. But not as as I think it's much better than before. There's not this sort of cons that this expectation. You know that that game of chicken where no one wants to be the last person to leave the office. Mm. I think that's that's gone, and that's a good thing. That that can die a death. I mean, I I don't mind sometimes working late to I'm complete happy thing. to be the last to to, to leave before yeah, anyone but else. I, that that thing. I mean, I've seen it where like literally it's like everyone's looking around and everyone's like, mm, you know, easy, you know everyone's yeah. and I just like I'm leaving. Look, I've done my shots. I'm going. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I've got, and that's one good thing about having kids, right? You, you at that point, you're like, look, you, you, this is just nonsense. Like, you know, you've done the work. <laughs> Why are you like just just what are you trying to prove by being here every night till eight when we're not even you know at the time when you need to be here late mm-hmm. when I, so. I was in architecture school that was uh, one of my uh my classmates she was very 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 competitive about like that like how much work she was putting into what she was doing mm-hmm. and so i had been working in a computer lab and so she was in the studio and uh it was like midnight or one o'clock in the morning and so I, I walk back towards the studio and she's locking up the studio. I said, oh, don't lock it. I'm still working. I still need to go in. And she goes, oh, okay. So then I go to my desk in the studio and then like 10 minutes later, she comes back in and she starts working again. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> There's this guy, I want to get him on the show actually, but he, he, he's one of the most efficient artists I know and he for years he would like come in early at like eight and work till five and leave at five and right. this was like stunning everyone was like shocked and he was producing more work than all the right. other you know compers that we were all the other freelancers we were getting and i think when right. i asked them to get him at molinaire that they, they saw his rate and they were like he's a bit expensive i was like, Don't worry. Just like it's fine and then when they got him in they were they were so happy like and, right. and in fact he was and before they you know, everything changed. He was a supervisor then. He's like one of the supervisors now, one of us. So, Sometimes know, the, more expensive people are more expensive for a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And But I think also you learn that that thing of like, look, you know, if it's, if, they've said, if they say you've got four shots to do today, that means you've got two hours for each shot. You know, you need right. to have that mentality, right? I mean, that's in advertising. I mean, in film, there isn't, there aren't really shots that you do in two hours. But there's right. still the idea that you've got to get a version in for dailies or you've got to get this, you know, this next milestone, this, this right. thing in. So I think that was good. I think, you know, being in broadcast where like if they say they want it for five, it's because it's on the air at five thirty or something. You know, then so <laughs> when I worked at Sky, a similar thing, there was like it was all people that had come from the big um film studios and they were working so Sky is like a um TV, um, satellite TV broadcast, right, 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 pay, uh, cable like a paid cable subscription type thing, right, and and they always finished at five, um, and so they were all you know all the seniors there. I was like voted prep at the time, but they all the all the seniors there. They'd all come from these big studios, and they're like, I've done the thing, I've done the Oscar, I've done this, I've done that, and I just want to finish on time. And you know, it was it was kind of <laughs> looks like because they're like, why are you why are you working on this this like not really exciting work? Uh, when you could, you know, you got this amazing, you know, history and like show realism. And they're like, you know what? I just, I just don't want to do all nighters anymore. I don't. Yeah, so I think exactly. that's improving. That, the machine learning, and then yeah, the real time stuff. I mean, although I, I still feel that it's going to take them a long time to get weaned to the idea that they have to make a decision. I think they, they've 
been trained for years. We talked about this one interview, but right. and, and I remember you, always, you were quite indignant. But I feel like they just don't want to swallow that pill. Like they, right. they will, they will film it and they'll use the thing and they'll do the they'll use the volumes, the LED screens, and they'll do all that stuff live. And they'll have this perfect feedback in the you know, uh, and they'll still want to change it right to the end. So there'll still be as much post production as before, which at the end of the day. However annoying or like critical, you know, how much. Yeah, still I don't, good. I don't <laughs> know. I think that there's, well, you got to change the mentality from the inside out. You know, you can't yeah. just say, but filmmakers are, you know, if that filmmakers are going to do that, then it's a different thing. But, but, but anyway, well, we, if you want to know more about that conversation, you guys could, should go and listen to the VFX Artist podcast where Daniel and I got into a long conversation about <laughs> the roles of <laughs> production <laughs> and how that's going to change everything. So, uh, but, but cool. Listen, we, we're up on a, on an hour now, uh, which is great. And I really had a, a great time talking to you guys. Kofi, yeah, congratulations likewise. on this, on this cool podcast. Thank and, you. Uh, they can find you on uh, Spotify and Apple podcasts. Now, are you using something like Lipsyn or something to, to, to broadcast your stuff? Or? Um, I'm using Buzzsprout. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. So, uh, so yeah, so go check it out. Uh, I'm sure he's got some great episodes up there and, uh, very much looking forward to broken toy. Is that, that's the title of it. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. And, and if you want to follow it if, on the website, which is broken toy uk, you can actually mm-hmm. sign up to a mailing list and I'm not spamming people because I know everyone's got, <laughs> you know, like if you buy a pair of shoes now, you get sent like a million emails about, about shoes and you like, leave me alone. Yep. But I, I just like when we've done some, uh, I've done some, I did some before it's in the podcast. We did interviews with the people that are the crew on the film. Um, we have written when we were going to do a shoot, um, and so when we do any kind of event with any any kind of milestone with the movie. So if you want to follow the project and, and sort of get involved and spread the word, then you know do sign up for that mailing list or follow the socials. But no, follow the mailing list first, but also the socials, which are on pretty much everything at Broken Toy Movie. And so UK. if you it's just no the the app yeah the website is broken toy movie dot uk oh right 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 and all the socials are just at broken toy movie perfect okay well then then people should definitely follow that and uh follow the podcast and thank you guys so much for for sharing your stories and your ambitions it's really great talking to you thank you for having us thank you thank you so much <laughs>